Sure, thanks so much, Sorna. And really pleased to be at this session, remembering Kamla, and so glad that we can do this from, from this space. Um, just listening to Rita, I was thinking that I should probably start by mentioning um, how conflict has framed um, our understanding of gender-based violence here in Bangladesh. So we're, because we're towards the end of our year of celebrating 50 years of independence and starting a celebration or commemoration of 50 years of the constitution. And of course, that means remembering the experience of the Birangona and how their, their lives and their struggles for justice were or were not um, counted or considered by the Bangladesh state and society. And what we can see 50 years on is that their experiences have been taken account of um, and are looking back at what, what they have faced is helping us to think more clearly about what we have done and have failed to do also for those who experience rape and sexual violence today in the contemporary context. So while we celebrate 50 years of, of uh, our history and 50 years of independence and talk about you know, what we what we have gained as an independent nation, it's obviously an urgent need for us to see why we are still being uh, regulated by essentially colonial laws as we celebrate this you know, moment of post-colonial um, um, independence. So all of our rape laws, uh, despite some special laws that we have on violence uh, against women, our definitions of rape, um, our definitions of, of the kind of evidence and procedures that we apply, all of course are from the 19th century, from the British colonial period. So many of our initiatives over the last few years from the women's movement and from human rights organizations have been about challenging these definitions. So challenging recently the rules on character evidence as our Pakistani colleague also mentioned, challenging the practices on two finger tests and also trying to enforce some of the positive aspects of, of the older legislation in terms of the duty to consider um, and, and respond to allegations of rape which are made, which we've seen where our, our current police force too often turn people away when they come to make complaints. Um, but I think the, the question for us in terms, I've put in the chat box a link to some of the current demands of the rape law reform uh, movement in Bangladesh, and Shireen will speak more about um, the activism around these issues. But I think it's also important for us in the women's movement to look at some of the contradictions and to be a bit wary of what it is we ask for. So there have been issues about the women's movement, I think, calling for draconian legislation, calling endlessly for you know, fast track procedures, harsh penalties, and so on. We've seen this in the past with the laws around violence against women. We're seeing it again now with the demands around cyber violence, for example. Just today, the Bangladesh courts have come up with a, an order saying that all plays on, on YouTube, on social media, and so on, Censorship and special censorship guidelines should be produced for those. So I think this approach of you know shutting things down, being protectionist, preventing speech, preventing critical thought and dissent, that feeds very dangerously into an environment where we already live within highly authoritarian and highly repressive structures. Someone spoke at the beginning about how we all enjoy democracy. Not all of us do um, in this region. And in that context, I think the way in which the women's movement frames this argument and the way in which we make our alliances are particularly critical. I just wanna end by mentioning again, the kinds of voices that aren't often heard and the kind of backlash also that is faced for raising demands. So for example, from the Chirong Hill tracks with Rita Manchanda mentioned, um, we are this week also going to celebrate 24 of the CHT in making demands for full implementation in the hill tracts, um, and particularly indigenous people. On the very same day, our Supreme Court is here, uh, is trying to of indigenous people. That special legislation is from the colonial independence, majoritarian, highly nationalist legislation. Final I think she may have fallen off the call, but would Shireen like to come in and we can come back and she can finish in about 30 seconds. Sorry. Sorry. Oh no, she's back, I think. 
I'll just say you know, one sentence, Shri, before I turn. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. I was just going to say that recently a group of activists were calling for changes to Hindu inheritance laws to allow women to enjoy the right to inheritance. And the activists were all targeted not by our usual friends, the, the Mary Mullahs who take on all the other issues about law reform, but by actually groups that identified themselves as representatives of the Hindu community. And these demands were shut down and they started bringing, they brought in, in fact several cases against those activists, accusing them of sentiment. Um, the kinds of alliances we need, we also need to look at the kinds of voices of opposition, where they're coming from. Within our national boundaries, gathering in a strong way than some, sometimes they it's movements to you, Shirin. Thank you, Sarah. I'm sorry that we didn't get to hear the end of Sarah's uh, talk. Uh, she was raising some very important issues around uh, how the women's movement frames itself and its demands in a situation of uh, an absence of democracy. Um, what I would like to start off by uh, is actually a reaction to, um, you know, for a long time we've heard, we've, we've talked about the endurization of the movement and jurisdiction of different movements, including the women's movement. And now we see the UNization of the women's movement, particularly with this 25, 16 days of activism and this airbrushing out the history of the women's movement in bringing, in, in bringing to the forefront the issue of um, violence against women, the protests, the International Day of Protest, which has its history as we know in the Dominican Republic, but also the importance of the international women's movement having lobbied for the recognition of violence against women as a human rights violation, which finally got a kind of official recognition in, at the World Conference in Vienna. So this is important, I think, for activists to, to keep in mind that although the UN has been an ally in a sense in facilitating the participation of activists in key policy arenas, and in, um, and in facilitating um, and highlighting many of our issues, it's still important not to conflate um, the activist space with that of the UN. The UN is after all a body of member states. So ultimately their phrasing of the, of the observance of this day is, uh, calling for the elimination of violence against women, whereas the movement has always called it a day of protest against violence against women. And I find that uh, this has now gone completely, you know, there's a gray, it's become, uh, what is the word? The, this distinction is not clear anymore, especially to a lot of younger feminists. They, they, have, they don't understand the distinction or they are not aware of this distinction. The second point I want to make is that as Sarah has talked about the law, the law is absolutely essential and important because it sets standards. It tells us what is possible, what is not possible, what is right, what is not right. However, what in the case of violence against women, it is a culture of misogyny that has to be tackled. The law, as somebody has already pointed out in the chat, the law is even progressive laws are not often implemented because of the culture um, which actually prevents enforcement, prevents implementation. So the culture of misogyny, which is deep rooted, beliefs in the inferiority of women in blah, blah, blah. I don't have to go into all that. And combined with that, in the case of Bangladesh and maybe other, other countries in South Asia, it's a culture of impunity, which is stemming from the absence of a rule of law. And we have a situation where if you are even remotely connected to power, you you will believe you can get away with things. And we saw that happening in a number of very um, outrageous cases of gang rape that uh, occurred all uh, in 2020, and which led to the an explosion of protest and um, in Bangladesh, and also to the formation, 
to the understanding or awareness that this fight is an intergenerational fight. And it's not just us, you know, us gray haired women. So we now have something in Bangladesh, which I'm very proud to be associated with, is Feminists Across Generations, which is an inter intergenerational alliance against gender-based violence. I want to also make a couple of other points. Um, in about a minute? Yes. One of the things that Sarah also mentioned, one of the problems is the women's movement's overemphasis on prosecution and punishment. And maybe it has to do with the fact that the dismantling the culture of misogyny seems like a, you know, an endless struggle. So it may have something to do with that. But what it leads to is also these kinds of uh, over overemphasis on punishment, and particularly on, as Tara mentioned, um, even the death penalty. We have the clamor for the death penalty coming from the younger generation, which is not only disappointing but also disturbing. And I know that for them, a lot, for a lot of them, it has to do with the lack of confidence in the judiciary, that the judiciary will um, meet out fair judgments. And that is why they, they go out in the streets and call for the death penalty as a solution to the problem. If I may make a couple of other points, which um, in response to what I've heard, or should I wait for another round for that? I think this is the round, so 30 seconds, if you can just flag those points. I just wanted to say, I don't think it's correct to say that the peace movement came out of the women's movement. It very much came out of flower power and the hippie movement on the one hand, and the campaign against nuclear, campaign for nuclear disarmament. So I don't think we should claim everything. Um, of course, women were very much part of those movements. Uh, the second thing I wanted to point out is that I don't know how helpful it is to call every form of oppression violence. In the 90s, or, or the late 90s, when we were struggling to uh, design for the government a multi-sectoral program on violence against women, we really had to focus on violence that causes physical harm. And this was important in terms of coming up with pragmatic responses to what is a very, very multi-dimensional problem. But to say that everything, to call, start calling everything violence does not help in the policy table. It does not help on the drawing table for programs. So I just wanted to make that point as well. And um, we must be careful about not essentializing the feminine. <laughs>